thank you for coming on this uh, very, what we might call, edgy, politically speaking, Sunday afternoon and so early in the afternoon. So what we'll do is we'll have a, a series of short talks on uh, various members of this uh, really remarkable family. unlike many of you here who uh, knew him or knew through family members, uh, came about when I was uh, teaching a class at Bishop University where I'm a professor in English literature. And I devised a new course called War and Literature and it was focusing on World War I. I was wanting to work out how to get the students who are geographically, historically, temporally distanced from the First World War. I had two grandfathers who fought in it and it explains also being raised in England. And uh, what I did was set up a project in which the students, often in pairs, shadowed a member of the bishop's community through the early 1900s to the end of the First World War. And I used basically universities' history and institutional connection. Bishops actually produces the longest running student publication in the country. During this World War I, it ran a special feature called Our Fighting Men, and it provided snippets of letters, updates about training, promotions, injuries, all things that provided me with sufficient information to literally deliver mail to my students every few classes as we moved through the war, so they could keep a, a, a tally of where they were going, they could map their shadows, and we were doing this alongside studying uh, poetry and prose. And as we were doing this, it immediately became noticed or notable that one family had sent four members to the war from bishops, and they were, of course, the Scott family. The patriarch Frederick George Scott, along with his three eldest sons, W.B., H.H., and Elton. So our subject, the subject of our presentation, is F.G. Scott, familiar, I can see, to many of you, but I'm hoping that we can give you a slightly different perspective by tracing his life through his connect connection to uh, Bishop's University. Frederick George was born in Montreal, April the 7th, 1861, and he started his undergraduate studies at McGill. Didn't go well, and he moved quickly across to Bishop's, where he flourished, receiving a Bachelor of Arts in 1881. Um, at Bishop's, Scott found a fertile ground for what would become the three pillars of his life, his religious faith, his love of family, and his love of poetry. And a colleague recalls many years later his encounters with F.G. Fred Scott entered the university in 1878 and was fond of spouting his early poetic efforts to a select few of his friends. The writer, although a good deal a senior, was constantly called upon to listen to these, and not being poetical himself, on several occasions threatened to murder him in the college woods if he did not shut up. How much poorer would the world have been if this threat had been carried out? After graduating in 1881, Scott continued his studies at King's College in London, where he immersed himself in Anglo-Catholic writings, known as the Oxford Movement, and the central figure of whom, uh, John Henry Newman, has just been canonised just this earlier this month. He returned to bishops for a master's degree in 1884, the same year that he was ordained deacon. He then returned to England to serve as a curate in Essex, and that's where he met, courted, and married Amy Brooke, who returned with him in 1887 to establish a home in Quebec, first in Drummondville, later at St. Matthew's Church in Quebec City, and they raised six children, the seventh having died, Charles, in infancy. All the while, Scott remained very faithful to his alma mater, participating in the Alumni Association, serving um, on the college board, um, and he uh, attended many of the numerous events. So we are very excited to discover recently this photograph of the old boys 1895 and the detail which was showing you is there is F.G. Scott in the far corner. He was a regular contributor to the MITRE. He first appears in the second issue with the very first alumni letter in which he jokes. I can tell of dark and terrible stories of the wild crowd, of dining room windows opened by stealth at midnight, and of hairbreadth escapes and stalking feet from Johnson's revolver. 
Yeah, we're not sure quite what Johnson was doing with the revolver, but the Dean doesn't carry one now, Dean of Student Affairs. Okay, other events he might have highlighted was the Sigma Affair, which is when the students protested the appalling food, or indeed the Great Fire of 1891 that destroyed the campus. On receiving an honorary degree in 1901, um, he took the opportunity to endow what later became known as the Archdeacon Deacon F. G. Scott Prize in Creative Writing, a prize that's still awarded annually today. Scott's poems appear regularly in the Mitre, as do reviews of his many poetry collections. Um, Scott was always a man of compassion, and bishops enabled him to develop his love of man, God and nature in productive and positive ways. His desire to help people in desperate, desperate circumstances is clear from an incident back in October the 10th, 1897, when he jumped off the Champlain Wharf in Quebec in the dead of night to save a drowning man, an act for which he was awarded the Stanhope Gold Medal by the Royal Humane Society. Scott's commitment to country and cause was never in question. He dates his patriotic spirit to attending the original Dominion Day celebrations on the grounds of McGill Campus, July the 1st, 1867, as a five-year-old with his father. It is only a bit of bunting, it's only an old colored rag, yet thousands have fought for its honor and shed their best blood for the flag. Despite uh, being 53 years old then, in 1914, Scott did not hesitate to sign up as chaplain of the 8th Royal Rifles in, uh, when General Hughes promised 20,000 Canadians to England. And he went with the Royal Chaplains. A day or so later, he telephoned the Department of Militia and Defense, Ottawa offering his services. Shortly afterwards, his son came to him somewhat troubled and mean and said, Dad, I think you ought to know that I enlisted today for service overseas. To which the canon gleefully replied with a warm pat on his son's shoulder, that's all right, son, I joined up yesterday. One can only imagine the conversation at home when the mother discovers four of them are going to be going on. Okay. So the three sons enlisted alongside or shortly afterwards they all studied arts at Bishops. Um, 1914 found Willem and Henry Hutton practicing law in Montreal, while the third son, Elton, was midway through his arts degree. And the fourth son, who we'll be discovering or learning more about in a minute, uh, was just commencing his studies also in arts. So Scott set off for Europe for, after a training period in Valcartier, exhilarated to be with his boys. An affectionate term referred literally to three of his sons but more broadly to fellow bishop's men, and then eventually to all the men of the Canadian Expeditionary Force. He wholeheartedly embraced his role as war chaplain, but he combined it with his calling as a poet. Throughout the war, he worked tirelessly to provide a linguistic, a spiritual, a mental, and a physical sound for those around him. Several of his war poems appeared for the first time in print in the college publication. There's poems such as Blood Guild, the Silent Toast, which was written at 4 a.m. after capturing Vinny Ridge, under the light of a storage battery found in a German dugout, Hymn of Humanity, A Grave in Flanders, and On the Lutz Bois, which Scott wrote shortly after finding out that his son Willem lost his eye and was returning home. Early 1915, uh, we read in the Maita how he's mentioned in dispatches. This is going to happen several times during his service there. The Mite is also full of testimonies and anecdotes about the decisive role that F.G. served and played amongst his men. And we just picked out some because they're just quite uh, um, remarkable. A week ago last Sunday, Ken and Scott celebrated the Holy Communion where we were then billeted. It was the most impressive service and, as we knelt in the bed of straw before the little altar in the barn, the sound of the big guns could be heard plainly. Many officers and men communicated. Canon Scott is just as jovial as ever, but has aged considerably. We discovered the other day that the bishop's men are quite close to us, at least their camp is. I met Canon Scott in the street the other evening. He is as happy and cheerful as ever. He says that he sees the bishop's men quite often. And this is, uh, this is my particular favorite one in which he manages to arrange a feast in early 1915, just behind the trenches. The party was held on March 7th in a villa not too far behind the lines. It was a notable occasion and expressions of surprise and gladness were heard on all sides. The party itself was done in good old watch style, details of which you could imagine. Mirabel Dictu, we had a lobster. Such a treat. Father Scott certainly did us proud. 
Now for those present, Ken and Alden looked in for a very few moments, though he couldn't stop. He gave us the very gratifying information that of the 20 Church of England chaplains at the front, seven are from bishops. Not bad, eh? We sang old Langston and gave a very hearty duo patamo and made nice little speeches about Ken and Scott before breaking up and departing through the snow to our respective dugouts, barns, etc. Things are not too bad. I've seen so many of our Lennox boys out here that I've been living again in memory the happy days spent there. Dear old Ken and Scott I see quite frequently, known and respected by all out here, and see Hepburn with his happy smile and sparkling humor. He then adds, Waterman lent me the miter a few days ago and I spent the evening in college again, reading it from cover to cover, even the ads. We are pleased to find that the magazine gives pleasure to our sorely tried men at the front. And uh, that, that references the co-eds back on campus sent packages out to uh, everybody serving from bishops and they included the latest editions of the Mitre to uh, keep them up to date with what was happening back on campus. After the service, I told Cannon that I thought it the most impressive meeting that I had ever attended and he said that he felt that about it too. He estimated that about a thousand men were present and I should say about 200 received the sacrament afterwards. Attendance was, of course, quite voluntary. His hold over the men is quite remarkable. I don't think that anyone in the Canadian Army is more generally respected. In fact, I should say that his position was quite unique. And so many of the references uh, uh, remind us or inform us about how he's offering these services, whether to just one or two men waiting to go over the front the next morning, or to these large assembled crowds. When Frederick George returned from the war, he uh, worked on, collected his uh, letters, and he assembled them into his memoir, The Great Wars I Saw It, 1922. Okay. But the war was not without a personal toll for uh, the Scott family. The eldest son, Willem, was shipped home in 1915, having lost an eye. And then in 1916, Frederick George receives the devastating news that Henry Hutton has been killed in the Regina Trench Offensive. He travelled to locate Henry's body that had been hastily buried but now lay in no man's land. And it, it, the memoir provides a very harrowing account of him trying to locate his son's body and perform the funeral rites. Um, it's identified by, by the ring on his hand. The slide here is of the hastily erected temporary grave marker. So the war tested his faith and certainly shaped his imperialist policies, but he never lost faith in his men and the rightness of their cause. Scott's open view of humanity and of a universal God is shaped by this imperialist upbringing and ideology, very much shaped, uh, prote uh, framed by his Anglican scripture. So poetry remains a core pillar shaping Scott's ability to live through the war and the atrocities and the bloodshed that he witnessed, but he was not above mocking his own compulsion to compose and recite poems. He describes in his memoir a growing awareness of people's agitation at his recitations. When he found out that Colonel Brusnell possessed a sidecar rather than hitchhiking, and one of the things he seems to annoy people a lot because he'll say, I'll just wait, God will provide, and he ends up getting a ride by somebody, a horse or a car or a tank, something, even a plane at one stage. Um, he, uh, the, the colonel was not happy about this, but he hears he's got this sidecar, and he said to him, Colonel, if you will give me a sidecar, I will recite you one of my poems. <laughs> As time went on, he says, I found the price I offered lost its value. So I hit upon another device. Colonel, if you don't give me the sidecar, I will recite one of my poems. <laughs> There's a constant mix of antipathetic and appreciative remarks with regard to Cannon's poetry because it did not always rally men together, but sometimes, as we said, produced the opposite effect. Scott was indeed adamant about writing and preferred the poem to any weapon, and many times even more than the gospel. We have a few quotes. When an officer asked Scott, how will you protect yourself, sir, if the enemy should get into the trench? He answered, I would recite one of my poems. They always put my friends to flight and would probably have the same effect upon my foes. <laughs> one of the more, uh, even more humorous, ridiculous scenes in the memoir describes the true po poetic zeal he possessed. When he comes across an officer he's not seen in a while, he's very excited and he says, I was at once determined to reward him by reciting him one of my recent poems. Scott says, I got about halfway through when the enemy began to shell the place. 
He became more and more restless and at last left me standing in the road with the last part of the poem. I looked after him for a moment or two, then turned sorrowfully, lamenting the depravity of human nature and pursued my journey. The canon's poetic eye allows, albeit only temporary, to transport both himself and his boys away from the horrors of the war to the minutely described beauty of the landscape back home in Canada. We read in 1918, on the eve of a major offensive, that Scott found himself with number one company of the machine gun battalion in what he described as a sandbag house on a sunken road above Inchy. After the meal, the colonel said to Scott, sit down, Cannon, give us some of your nature poems to take our minds off this beastly business. He replies, or he writes, it was very seldom I was invited to recite my poems with so much <laughs> so such an opportunity could not be lost. I sat down and repeated The Unnamed Lake, a poem I wrote among the Laurentian Mountains in the happy days before we even thought of uh, the war. Sleeps among the thousand hills where no man ever trod, and only nature's music fills the silences of God. Great mountains tower above its shore, green rushes fringe its brim, and over its breast forevermore the wanton breezes skim. Among the cloud-capped solitudes, no sound the silence broke, save when, in whispers down the woods, the guardian mountains spoke. He writes in the reply, like a gramophone record, it carried our minds away into another world. For myself, who remembered the scenery that surrounded me when I wrote it, and who now, in that filthy hole, looked at the faces of young men who in two or three hours were to brave death in one of the biggest tasks that had been laid upon us. The words stirred up all sorts of conflicting emotions. I paused in the middle of a poem, and there to my astonishment, I found that everyone was sound asleep. It was the best thing that could have ever happened. <laughs> On September the 30th, uh, 1918, uh, Frederick George was seriously wounded when he was hit by shrapnel in his lower leg, limbs. He recounts in his memoir, the great pain in my heart made it hard to breathe. So when I was brought to the dressing station, I said, boys, I'm going to call for my first and last tot of rum. A general wrote to Scott shortly afterwards saying how shocked he was to hear of his wounds but it was even, that was nothing in comparison to the shock of learning how Scott, a teetotaler, had turned to drinking rum. News of his injury circulated widely and speak to his also almost totemic status amongst his boys. Just a little bald notice on perusing, which the man in the street would probably say, nothing in that, all kinds of officers in other ranks were wounded on that day. But then, the man in the street does not know Canon Scott. Ask any man who is wearing the red patch, who is Canon Scott? Universal answer amounts to this. Canon Scott is the morale of the first division. To see the old Canon with a tin hat on his head and a cheery smile on his face, jogging along the front is as good as a rum ration to any of the boys. And now he is wounded in a way often blighty. Good luck. Narrowly avoiding amputation, he was sent to England to convalesce. And there's a picture of him with his son um, Elton at his side. Sunday, May the 4th, 1919, on the Empress of Britain, after an absence of four years and seven months, Scott returned to Quebec. He'd been mentioned in dispatches four times, made a companion of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, and awarded the Distinguished Service Order. Scott returned to his duties at St. Matthew's Church, Quebec, where one of the first things he did was to erect a memorial to his son, Henry Hutton. He continued to have a lively presence of bishops attending many convocations, alumni dinners, always presenting himself, in, always presenting entertaining, often self-effacing, impromptu speeches. He continued to publish his poems with the mitre throughout his life. But Scott's war experience forged a permanent bond with the veterans of the Great War. When he learned of the labour troubles in Winnipeg in 1919, he did not hesitate to travel there to try and mediate between pro- and anti-strike factions of the Great War Veterans Association. Colonel War, in his memoir of him, describes how, in the midst of all this, he says, in the midst of this turmoil suddenly appeared Canon Scott, who had so recently crossed the Atlantic with the men of the 8th Battalion. The government of the Prince of Manitoba did not appreciate his kindly office, 
and soon sent frantic wires to Ottawa requesting that Canon Scott be ordered to return to Quebec. But in fact, Scott exercised a tremendous influence for good in tempering the spirits of the Winnipeg veterans, and that it was through his efforts that they abandoned their plan to march on Ottawa, a movement instigated, according to where, by the red elements of the unions. And he apparently quoted some lines from his poem, The Unbroken Line. Ye who have trod the borderlands of death, where courage high walks hand in hand with fear, shall we not hearken with the spirit set? All ye were brothers there, be brothers here. This labour dispute consolidated Scott's support for improved working conditions, standards of living, unionisation. His concern for social justice was a natural extension of his Anglo-Catholic faith that encouraged active work for a better world. Scott's support and championing of his boys led to post-war social activism, that their war efforts and sacrifices should not be forgotten by those in power. The war had been fought, had been about a fight for good, and he was insistent that all should benefit from the peace. In November 1919, Scott delivered an inspiring oration at the University of Toronto's Convocation Hall, praising Woodrow Wilson's pursuit of a League of Nations. And he argued, quote, we should hold up this vision at all times, the vision of nations understanding one another. Seems very pertinent at the moment. This drive led him to support many movements for social reform over the remainder of his life. At Winnipeg, he joined forces with the social gospel activist J.S. Woodsworth, Winnipeg-based Methodist minister, future leader of the CCF. His war memoir was published in 1922, initially priced at $3, and all royalties were donated to veterans. And as he travelled the country, Scott met thousands of men and women involved in the war effort who signed this personal copy of him, making it virtually impossible to read. His memoir, made Ill illegible by thousands of signatures, is a physical testament of the canon's impact on each individual he came across while serving in Europe and those he met travelling across Canada post-war. And many of them were uh, families who had lost uh, boys that he knew and they would uh, have that connection for him, through him. In 1923, Scott spoke out against the deplorable working conditions at the British Empire Steel Corporation in Sydney, Nova Scotia. He likened the working conditions of striking steel workers to life on the gas battlefield of France and the living conditions of the Sydney slums to the trenches of the Western Front. In 1932, he worked to raise awareness of the appalling conditions in the Kingston Penitentiary following the riots there. And in 1934, he was a keynote celebrant at two services at the Great War Veterans Reunion in Toronto. On the 4th, Scott, now an archdeacon and 73 years old, presided over the memorial service at the Cenotaph in front of Toronto City Hall. He returned to Europe in 1936 for the unveiling of Canada's War Memorial. And also he and his wife were able to see the official site now for their son, Henry Hutton. In 1938, Scott, now 77, when he saw a trouble brewing Europe, volunteered for service overseas. The Minister of Defence kindly thanked him but declined the offer. Uh, Scott followed the war very carefully and family were very much involved. Uh, he died January the 18th, 1944. A first memorial service was held at the Anglican Cathedral in Quebec on that Friday the 21st and a second the following day at the Christ Church Cathedral in Montreal. Scott was a devoted priest, poet, father and a bishop's man to his very last breath. I guess it's the romantic individualism which makes me admire Frank Scott uh, as much as I do. As it happens, when I went to McGill, it was after uh, Frank's deanship, uh, it was 68, uh, and I didn't meet him when I was an undergraduate. But I did meet him afterwards when I came back as a professor 
and I uh, spent many coffee breaks and some uh, faculty retreats at the Gulf Estate in his company. I spoke a lot with him, but I never got to know the man. Frank was intensely private. He didn't talk about his life. He talked about the Constitution. Uh, he talked about Roccarelli and Duplessis. He, he talked about uh, the persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses and Communists in the 50s. Uh, he, he could be got to discuss literature, but even then, not in an intensely personal way. Uh, it was only later, through various readings and so on, that I put together the brilliant, old, uh, but nevertheless uh, uh, very witty and, and uh, uh, capable conversationalist with the man who uh, had lived a romantic individual life, life and who had no fear. I think Frank's life is a lesson to today because Frank was not politically correct. He didn't do the things that would uh, get you uh, positions, uh, and that's why he had such a hard time becoming the dean. Uh, but other things too. He was a person who did not conform and nevertheless succeeded. If you have said something 20 years ago that is unfashionable by today's standards, you're destroyed. But Frank did say things that 20 or 30 years later were highly controversial, and they only added to his uh, great prestige. So he had to change positions and never, never from to, to gain uh, things for himself, change positions, navigate in a world of changing circumstances. So first thing is he came from a family of a poet, yes, a clergyman, uh, and a deeply religious clergyman, and an imperialist. And the initial Frank Scott seemed to be following uh, in, in that direction, certainly very interested in poetry, which remained uh, uh, a theme of his life, but also very preoccupied with good and evil, right and wrong. Yet we all know, at least I think we, we all know, that Frank was not a religious man later, that he changed. And he wanted to fight uh, in World War I. He was young when it started. He was born in 1899. But in the end, it was an accident that prevented him from, uh, from going. Uh, but once again, when it came to World War II, and we'll have to discuss that, uh, Frank had turned to a near pacifist. So in the 1920s, he went to Oxford. Uh, he uh, did mostly poetry there, poetry readings, poetry groups, and he became interested in modern poetry, very different from his father, who had been uh, a poet in the Canadian, uh, you'd call that perhaps a romantic imperialist tradition, uh, in which you, you, you combine Canadian colors and forests and trees with a strongly, a strong sense of empire. And uh, Frank became interested in the poetry of his time, and uh, he became, in the 20s, a distinguished poet. Now his poetry is really divided into two, into two things that are really quite different. One can be compared perhaps to the painting of the group of seven, to Harris and people like that, the jagged Canadian landscapes, the uh, uh, anguished poems, uh, and so on. The other are witty aphorisms. Of course, the most famous one that has always remained with us is about poor Mackenzie King, who did not let his on the one hand know what his on the other hand was doing. Uh, I think uh, uh, today's politicians don't have either on the one hand or the other, so Mackenzie King may be uh, fortunate in at least uh, having lost one from the other, but not both. Um, but his uh, aphorisms are what has remained uh, very, very living in today's canon. I think the rest of the poetry has as well. The rest of the poetry is more difficult. The witty political poems are accessible uh, to everybody. After his marriage and so on, Marion and Frank lost their religious belief and lost their imperialism. And Frank became a nationalist. His main concern, and that was one of the reasons for not wanting to go to war when Britain went to war, was that he was a Canadian nationalist in the 20s and 30s. That was when Canada was, in fact, 
becoming a nation. Frank wanted a, a particularly Canadian thing. Now, I don't think Frank would have been nationalist in that way in the 70s uh, or, or 80s. Uh, but again, times were dif different. And the <coughs> purpose of his views in the 1920s was to get a, an independent Canada, one that would be able to go its own way. And it also, of course, uh, went along with his uh, love of the landscape, of the vision of Canada as a, uh, a vast and, in some ways, dark land of trees and lakes and so on. There are two things that then started. His legal career, which took a long time. He didn't want to become a lawyer. His, uh, he came back from Oxford. He taught. He did all sorts of things. He stumbled into law. Uh, but what a fortunate event that he did stumble into law and chose that as the ultimate thing to do because he could have remained a teacher. He joined the, the faculty and he, um, uh, most important, helped found the CCF. Uh, Frank was actually writing the program and the program <coughs> included the nationalization of the basic means of production, uh, of course, total Canadian independence. It did not, at that point, put much stress on French, although he was always uh, uh, pro-Quebec in that way, but he also understood that Quebec was a uh, right-wing clerical place with which he was to come to blows in the 1950s over uh, that type of thing. So uh, he spent the 30s very much in politics, not running, but drafting programs, going all over the country, organizing the CCF with considerable success, but not in Quebec. Uh, the um, uh, CCF started to elect people, and uh, he got on the blacklist of uh, McConnell, Montreal, ultimately the Montreal Star, everybody. He had no fears about taking uh, this unpopular position. But then came the thing for which in today's world, he might not have been forgiven his opposition to the war. His opposition to the war, which later, of course, uh, uh, it, it sounded as though he had joined forces with the clerical, uh, anti-English people in Quebec who didn't want conscription, uh, but it was his profound humanism, his belief that killing was wrong. But look how far he had moved from the young man who was expressing uh, religious and imperialist views as a teenager to the man who opposed the war on principle, even though he made it clear he loathed Hitler, and that it was not out of any sympathy. And of course, by then he was allied with uh, people like David Lewis. Uh, it was obvious that he was in no way uh, pro-Nazi or, or anti-Semitic or, or, or anything of, of, of that uh, sort. He continued to teach, and uh, he did want to be dean. It took him a long time to get there. But then he went into practice, went into the practice of law, but only for a few cases. But his cases are the leading, uh, not the labor one that he lost in the 60s, which is not very important, but the ones that he won in the 50s are among the leading cases of law altogether. He explained that because McGill challenged him again, not politically correct. We don't want our professor around the courthouse uh, spouting left-wing views. And he said he had to do it because of financial reasons. He had to support his family. How can he uh, manage? Uh, well, I don't think it had, I don't think he made money in practice. I think he made law in practice. And the issue was Duplessis in the, of course, the Padlock case, but especially Roncarelli and Duplessis, the most important uh, cases uh, in uh, Canadian constitutional history. They were not, he was not a member and he would have disapproved without any doubt, just like John Humphrey, whom I knew much longer, but he was a close friend of mine towards the end, who was another man, who, a, a non-conventional professor of law who was on the left in those days when you weren't supposed to. John Humphrey was totally opposed to identity politics, and I think Frank Scott would have been as well. Uh, he, he would have said, no, that's not my CCF. My CCF was individual equality. Uh, my uh, uh, 
position on constitutional was ind individual liberty, the right of each person to uh, just treatment, and not dividing, deciding which group got how much, and whether there were enough of this group or that group or anybody else in, uh, on a committee. I think an incident in Roncarelli and Duplessis um, uh, illustrates the nature of uh, Frank uh, Scott. Uh, before he became counsel, Mr. A.L. Stein, who was Roncarelli's uh, original lawyer, uh, went around looking for counsel in the big offices. He realized that it would be difficult in the circumstance of the late 40s and early 50s for a relatively small Jewish lawyer to beat the premier of Quebec and he wanted a name that sounded Scottish and uh, whatever. And he went and in one of the big law firms he was told, look here Stein, in this business you hunt with the hounds or you run with the hares and we've made our choice. And therefore, he was to see Frank Scott. Frank Scott did not hunt with the hounds. Frank Scott took on Duplessis, I think, with glee. And I, I, I understand that he would refer to him as, as, as D, but he, he had long loathed him and his regime. And, and the surprising uh, return to power in 1944, uh, of course, uh, uh, the, 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 the attempt, vain attempt by Duplessis to prevent the growth of a union movement or of, of social justice or of university grants or of education and so on. So with the principles that were established in 1950, and it's all to the credit of our Supreme Court uh, that it, because in the United States all of the anti-communist things failed. And the Rosenbergs were executed and so on. In Canada, the Supreme Court of Canada over and over again and twice because of Frank Scott said no. Our Supreme Court, without being at all a radical court, uh, and it was not one of Frank's uh, cases, uh, Scott's cases, but in, you know, it, it was in that period of time in, in uh, uh, Smith and Ruling when the Supreme Court faced with a refusal of a uh, Nova Scotia Labor Relations Board to certify a union because the Secretary General was a communist. Mr. Justice Rand said there are certain facts that must be faced. Uh, no one can doubt the pernicious nature of communist doctrine, but it is not illegal to be a communist in this country. A communist can be elected to the highest office, etc. I think the Nova Scotia Labor, Labor Relations Board uh, had as its duty to assess the nature of the union, not the political views of its secretary general. Um, but uh, Roncarelli and Duplessis was particularly important. I was fortunate enough to do my stash in an office with Poteau's counsel in 1971, and I in 74, I challenged Poteau and Roncarelli and Duplessis, and he said, I'm still uncomfortable with it, but you have to understand that in those days it meant, for a French Canadian, it meant being totally isolated if you went that way. So I found a way of saying Duplessis was wrong, but the case should be thrown out, and I could sleep better, uh, and I didn't have to face it when Frank Scott didn't worry about it. It had the same effect. On the English side, it was perhaps a little less total, the, the, the uh, uh, isolation, but it was a daring thing to do. The next thing that has to be seen as very daring and very important is Lady Chatterley's Lover. Uh, the book had been published in some places, but not in others. Uh, the Canadian Supreme Court was ahead, I believe, of the House of Lords in saying that it could be done. Um, one of the things that we have to remember is that in today's world, Frank Scott could get into trouble with the politically correct. After all, uh, D.H. Lawrence believed that men and women were different and that women needed men at all times, whereas men needed each other. He said some silly things, I think. I, on the other hand, I, I don't think there are many books that are better than uh, The Rainbow and Women in, in Love. Uh, I, I do not, I am not of the school that James Joyce was the greatest novelist, I think Lawrence was, but Lawrence is really being, uh, Lawrence and Virginia Woolf, but Lawrence is really uh, very much disapproved today, and a fight for D.H. Lawrence today might well, and, and especially the Lady Chatterley's lover, uh, might well not please some of the adepts 
of political correctness. Uh, but Frank uh, did not hesitate about that, and he got the judgment from the Supreme Court of Canada. Now, we must remember once again, Mr. Justice Tasho, who had dissented on Ron Corelli and Duplessy, his dissent I shall never forget. He said, the author, evidently not without some talent, believes that adultery and fornication are the answers to the problem of the 20th century. And then he went on with his dissent, with uh, 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 all of uh, his uh, uh, venom uh, possible. So he got it, but not unanimously. He still did not get through to that right-wing clerical thing. Now, for, Frank then became very much in favor of bilingualism and of the right of Quebec uh, to work in French, uh, to be French. Nevertheless, and he, and he was a friend of Pierre Trudeau, and not, did not turn away from him when Trudeau switched parties. Uh, that was, uh, he understood that uh, the, as long as you make a contribution, the label uh, was uh, less important. But Frank then turned very much against Quebec nationalism. Once again, he might not be very popular. He supported the War Measures Act. I'll say right away, I think he was wrong in that. Uh, but I, uh, I think that went too far. But at the same time, he did understand that the type of nationalism that was being preached by Quebec was not what he had meant when he said he was a nationalist in the 1920s. Not that type of nationalism, but a open, uh, a, a, an assertion of Canada, yes, but not a, an exclusion of others. I remember Roncarelli and Duplessy was the great Bible of civil liberties. The premier cannot call somebody and say cancel his uh, liquor license. And now all of a sudden, the prime minister, who's his friend, could arrest 300 people without a warrant and without real grounds and release them a few months later. Now, admittedly, you see people on the other side who compared this to, to uh, Joseph Stalin or Hitler uh, forget that the, 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 the other side of the coin, that all of them were released unharmed. Um, but uh, you know, Frank took a position which was quite controversial in his own circles. He was able to turn against his own circles, always courteously, intellectually, and uh, uh, with uh, Grace, but with firmly. When I knew him, he was very much I mean, a centralist. He, he did not believe that powers should re be given up in a, that major powers should be given up by the federal government. He did believe, he continued to believe in, in uh, French and the use of uh, both languages. The lesson that we get uh, from Frank Scott in today's world is that a public intellectual is only significant if he dare says no to society, not if he echoes society. There are always various people, a thousand people, who will get up today and tell you how important it is uh, to, to support multiculturalism, diversity at all costs, etc. But wouldn't have said that 30 years ago, and perhaps will stop saying that 20 years ago from now, 30 years from now, if the pendulum swings in a different direction. Frank went from imperialism to socialism at a time when many people did not. People did that in the 60s, but not so much in the 20s. Frank wrote modern poetry at a time when Canada uh, was really quite traditional, and Roberts and, and, and people like that were, there, were, there was a new school of poetry, of course, that was like him, but he was uh, very much a, a, <coughs> a pioneer in the poetry. He opposed the war on a monster whom he recognized as a monster, both because he thought Canada should not be an appendage of Britain and because he thought that uh, uh, war was absolutely wrong. And he fought against the McGill establishment, Quebec establishment, his own brother, whenever that was necessary. So, I would want to present Frank Scott not only as a man who achieved a tremendous amount, because he did, but as a man 
who was a true model and as a symbol of courage. When my youngest brother Andrew was 10 or 11, I walked over to the Scots house with him one afternoon. Frank was lending Andrew some concretions for a school science project. Concretions are fossil-like entities that Frank liked to search for <coughs> along the banks of the Coaticook River. Marion welcomed us in, and we chatted with her in the hall as we waited for Frank to come down. The large front hall of the Clark Avenue house, which you see here, opened onto both the living and dining rooms, where several of Marion's paintings hung along the walls. This was Andrew's first visit to the Scott City House. After taking in his surroundings, he said, You know, Mrs. Scott, someday you'll be famous. <laughs> well, Marion is not yet famous. But she has survived and succeeded. She is recognized and respected. She was unique among the women artists of her day in continuing to evolve artistically into her late 80s, never making one style her signature style, but always moving on to new explorations. As a girl, Marion always liked to draw and she recognized her vocation when she was a young girl. At the age of 11, encouraged by her parents, she enrolled in the School of the Art Association of Montreal. At the age of 15, she attended the girls' school to study when she realized she must learn to read and write. But after two years, she went back to the arts as a student at the École des Beaux-Arts. She left the Beaux-Arts in 1926 to study at the Slade School in London. However, the year before she left for London, Marion met Francis Reginald Scott. A former Rhodes Scholar, Frank was one of a group of like-minded young men dedicated to the social and cultural well-being of Canada. Some among them had created the Leonardo Society, which, while dedicated to promoting European art, also took an active interest in the work of the Group of Seven. The two met at a private party. Their attraction was immediate and mutual. Each of them wrote of this new acquaintance in their diaries and their particular pleasure in discussing subjects that were of interest to both art, of course, yes, but also the world they lived in and their responsibility to it. Frank and Marion continued to meet at parties, and as their friendship deepened, they added new dimensions, going for long walks on the mountain or beside the river, or going to exhibitions. In time, they knew they were deeply in love. They had begun their lifelong conversation. Nonetheless, Marion was determined to pursue her study of art. Resisting the conventions of her day, she confided in her diary, I mean to live my life fully. I am leaving my home and my country for the sake of experience and life. She went on to say, while no woman has fully lived life without marriage and children, she would never marry for the sake of marriage and would only sacrifice her freedom for someone with whom she was congenial, quote, a friend as well as a lover with whom I can share my love of ideas and pictures and life. Marion had already found that man in Frank, and a year after she returned from London, the two were married in February 1928. A year later, their son Peter was born. Dis 
Despite being a devoted mother and conscientious wife, Marion was able to reserve a considerable amount of time for painting in her early years of domesticity. She also submitted work to exhibitions, the Spring Exhibitions of the Art Association of Montreal, the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts, and the annual exhibitions of Quebec artists that Eaton's department store used to organize, if anyone remembers that. And she submitted this painting, Quebec Fields, to the Ontario Society of the Artists' Annual Exhibition in 1932. Here, rather than depending on naturalistic effects, this landscape depends on the geometric shape of the triangle, which, as Marion wrote in her diary, is the unifying factor of all the compositional elements, both from a formalist and expressionist perspective. The juxtaposition of vivid colors also proclaim this painting as a modern work. Marion continued to explore different subjects and techniques. For example, this painting, Gorge, which she painted in 1936, is reminiscent in subject and composition of the group of seven, with its simplified broad strokes and a decorative approach. Marion was also among the first Canadian artists to break away from the Canadian tradition of landscapes, backyards, a familiar subject to women who were painting from their houses. Marion was among a number of Quebec women artists in her representations of human subjects and urban life. This escalator was a favorite theme of Marion's, of which there are four known representations quite similar to this. As Marion wrote in her diary, her goal at this time was to talk to all men, meaning people, and to be aware of the universe, and here she means the social universe. This example shows a broad view of the stairwell with the diagonals of the two escalators on which an undifferentiated mass of passengers ride up and down. But Marion also sought to express the transcendent spirit that informs all life. As she wrote in her diary, I must become more delicate and tender. Let Georgia O'Keeffe be my godmother. <laughs> and here we see one of her paintings inspired by Georgia O'Keeffe, Evening Primrose, where you really get the sense of the opening up of the spiritual energy. This time, Marion also experimented with portraits. This portrait of Lois Gordon is a striking example. Lois was the sister of King Gordon, a fellow founding member, along with Frank, of the League for Social Reconstruction and the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, or CCF, forerunner of the NDP. Marion was also a devoted mother. She told me how difficult it was to keep Peter quiet when Frank was trying to write. And when they were in the country, she used to take him out into the woods with pots and lids and metal spoons and bang as loud as he could in order to get his noise energy out of him. <laughs> she also volunteered to teach at his school, St. George's School, and as a matter of fact, Frank and Marion were amongst the parents who founded that school. It was a school founded by like-minded parents who felt that there wasn't a school that could serve their children the way they wanted them to be educated. And along with her friends, Fritz Brantner and Norman Bethune, Marion started Saturday morning art classes for inner city children. She worked hard at this time to create and maintain a community of like-minded artistic friends and colleagues. In 1939, Marion was a founding member of the Montreal Contemporary Art Society. She also participated in conferences, such as the Conference of Canadian Artists in 1941, and submitted her paintings to exhibitions. The same year, the family moved into the Clark Avenue house, 451 Clark Avenue, so that Peter could be near Westmount High School and also where Marion had a lovely big room that she used as her studio. She also had impressed upon her at that time the distinct division 
in Montreal bourgeois society between the artists. She told me of a time when she had submitted a painting to an exhibition. I think it was one of the ones supposed by the Women's Committee of this very building, the museum. And the, she arrived with the artists for the opening of the, muse, of the exhibition. She bought a new hat with a veil, very stylish, so it must have been in the 40s. And the doors were flung open to the exhibit. And as the artists approached the, art, the entrance, the convener of the exhibit said, oh, we didn't expect the artists. <laughs> so Marion's group turned around and went over to the Ritz bar and had their own celebration. <laughs> and it was around this time too that Marion told me that it was very difficult for her when she was in social gatherings with the ones that she and Frank met, went to many social gatherings and they weren't Mar Marion's favorite sport. And she told me how people would say to her, oh, you artists, you're always ahead of your time. And Marion would say, no, we're not. We're in our time. It's you who are behind the times. <laughs> At this time, she also wrote of her desire to leave the ivory tower of the studio and participate in what she called the democratization of art. Her friend, endocrinologist Hans Selye, who was to become famous for his research on stress, made one manifestation of this desire possible. Through his intervention, McGill's Faculty of Medicine commissioned Marion's mural, Endocrinology, for the Strathcona Medical Building. Marion worked for 18 months on this mural. She prepared herself by reading texts on the endocrine system and the life and multiplication of cells. In the finished piece, a strong male figure stands in the center. He's the researcher. He's surrounded by cells, amoebas, human bodies, some of which are whole, others malformed. Dr. Sellier, in an article that appeared in Canadian Art on art as an inspiration to science, lauded Marion's achievement in conveying the true spirit of scientific inquiry. Both Marion and Frank were embedded in a world of socially transformative activists, not just thinkers. And the two met frequently with Quebecois artists and writers at the home of Jean Pellardy. Interestingly, Gabrielle Roy was part of this group. Her Bonheur d'Occasion appeared in 1945 with its starkly realistic portrait of Montreal life in the St. Henri neighborhood. Marion's paintings of the urban and industrialized world are among her best known and most discussed work, particularly stylized scenes like this of Montreal. And just like Frank, Marion was a dedicated pacifist. She was a founding member of the Voice of Women and continued to protest in the cause of peace into her early 80s. There is no denying that Marion found of the couple's private social life psychically exhausting, both in Montreal and at their country house in North Hatley. Here's Frank paddling on Lake Massawippi. These social occasions <coughs> were psychically exhausting not only because they were time consuming, but also because Marion was shy and disliked small talk. She also experienced great pain from Frank's dalliances with other women. Although they had discussed the ideas of Bertrand Russell on open marriage before their own marriage, her pain at Frank's betrayals, as she felt, caused her great unhappiness. And in 1950, she moved out and rented an apartment on Peel Street. She had been teaching, and so she had her own income and could support herself. But Frank came to visit her every day. And they would sit and talk on the balcony and carry on their conversation. And eventually, he convinced her to move back home to 451 Clark Avenue, which she did, although she came back with a resolution 
which she wrote in her diary. No more parties, no movies, just painting. In the mid-1950s, Mary was commissioned to create this mural for the non-denominational chapel in the Montreal General Hospital. It's known as the Tree of Life, but Marion wanted to call it the Burning Bush. You can see there in the middle, there's a barely discernible human form of the center of a burning tree, depicting the inevitable human pain and suffering in the midst of ever-renewing joy. By the 1960s, having explored different modalities of expression, Marion turned to abstract art. At this time, Marion expressed her creativity through large non-representational paintings, simple in line and vibrant in color. She was one of the few Anglophone painters of her generation to make the transition to geometric abstraction, which had long been and continues to be the purview of Francophone artists. By 1982, <laughs> Marion's artistic expression lightened, or you might say opened. This untitled canvas was one in a series inspired by Marion's exploration of the cell. A painting similar to this hung in the Scots front hall. It was one of my favorites and I used to linger in front of it. For me, it evoked the solar system, macrocosm, just as easily microcosm. My intimacy with Mary and Frank began around this time, although I had known them since childhood as friends of my parents. In 1982, Frank asked me if I would consider being his part-time administrative assistant. His hands were badly crippled with arthritis, and it was becoming less and less possible for him to hold a pen. His main concern was for Marion. He didn't want her to forsake her painting for tedious tasks. I thus adopted the practice of going to the Clark Avenue house for two mornings or afternoons a week. I grew to love her very much at this time. She was bird-like in all the best senses of the term, lyrical and self-contained. She brought an exquisite precision to all she did and said, her strength of spirit shining through her bright eyes and smile. <coughs> I loved listening to Marion and Frank converse. She would never let him get away with anything and would often follow up on a remark he made by saying, what do you mean by that, Franco? Her special name for Frank. I began this work. Frank suffered a stroke and was confined to bed. At this point, Marion gave up painting completely and devoted herself to running the household, nurses around the clock, a cook to provide them with meals, and other household duties to attend to. I kept on visiting the house, and she always left the door open for me when she knew I was coming. This long period was hard on Marion, and she got fatigued. After Frank died in 1985, Marion mourned him deeply and profoundly for many months. But her resilient spirit roused her. She bought a new sofa, had the vestibule painted deep pink, and the rest of the house repainted white. Then she resumed her work and created a new series of paintings alive with energy. She told me she was now painting with greater freedom than she had ever before experienced. This large untitled canvas painted in 1992 stands out. As you can see, Marion applied copious amounts of paint and then used both her brush and her hands to create a third dimension. She said of herself at this time that she was dancing with paint. Paintings in this series were her last. In the spring of 1993, Marion fell and fractured her spine. Now it was her turn to lie in bed in the front bedroom her visitors reduced to a regular, faithful few. Shortly before her death, the city cut down the large elm tree that stood in front of the house. The house looked quite bereft without it, but Marion said, don't you see, 
More light is coming in. At Marion's memorial service, Ron Graham said, Marion became lighter and lighter until she became light itself. families going back to my grandmother in Quebec City and my father and then streaming down through bishops uh, we have known uh, even my sister was a great friend of a really great friend of one of the Scott descendants and uh, and that's all I'm going to very briefly tell you about our impression of the Scots from that before he went to war, he, he was already, I think, the, the Archdeacon of uh, Quebec. And when he went overseas, he was dearly, dearly loved by the troops. My father was younger, a lot younger, and yet he had a huge admiration for Archdeacon Scott. And he introduced me to him on a train ride from Quebec City to La Malbec. I don't remember too much about it. I must be about five or six years old, but but I do remember meeting him, and I do remember my father's adulation of this man. His relationship with my grandmother, who was an urban from Quebec City, quite different. But they were really good friends. They were both had a lot of wit, and they enjoyed exchanging with each other. And one of the stories that I've always been told and I've always loved was he went to tea at the Kennedys in La Malde. There were nine children and uh, they had a little tea room. And when he got home, he left his rubbers at the Kennedys. So he phoned and he said, Katie, I'm sorry to bother you, but I've got home and I've lost my rubbers. Well, she said, it's too bad. You'll never see them again. And he said, why? And she said, well, I have nine children. They all have rubbers. And do you think I'm going to find them amongst them? No, oh, yes, you are. He said. She said, why do you say that? He said, go into the children's dining. Go through the rubbers. And you'll see rubbers with two red spots on the heel. And underneath that is written this bloody spot means Cam Scott. <laughs> and that was the beginning of a poetic career that was to go way beyond <laughs> the brilliance of that. He gave a lift in two lines. He's certain of the return of his brother's picture, of course. <laughs> but then it really was quite amazing what he and his wife produced and what happened in each case almost. And they're not all on the screen. And I'm going to just say a couple of words about those who are not. First, of course, is the Chief Justice, the Associate Chief Justice Loeb Scott, who was a tiger of a man, a very good lawyer before he went to the bench. A very terrifying man in many ways. Not a soft side like some of the other Scots, but very competent and very much in disagreement with Frank on every single thing that Frank said. So he was as far right as Frank was left. And, I mean, really, it was quite amazing how they lived in Montreal. They carried very important positions connected to the law in many ways. And yet, that's the way it worked. And I don't know what their real relationship was, but couldn't have been sweet. And yet, it existed and they survived it and they both continued to have amazing careers. I think Willem Scott intervened a bit when they wanted to appoint Frank the Dean. I don't think I know. Uh, and J.W. McConnell intervened because DuPlessis was so mad at Frank for intervening in the Roncarelli case all the way to the Supreme Court, that he told Miguel that if they appointed Frank Medine, they wouldn't get another nickel from the UNSNL government. 
And it took a certain number of deaths of our Frank ultimately to be the dean and, and all these political people standing in his way. And my God, were we happy. I don't think there was any graduate from McGill Law College that didn't think Frank's got to be the dean. And so, thank God, at the end, he was the dean. And a very fine dean he was, and probably, I don't think probably, I think without doubt, the best law professor that McGill in many ways has had. And there were some marvelous law professors, but uh, he really was a superstar. But I'm not here to talk about Frank, I just said that on pass on. <laughs> and then there was Elton Scott. And Elton Scott hasn't been mentioned for us. Elton Scott was one of the important ones. He married my mother and father in 1929. He married my wife and I in 1955. He was that close to the family that when I applied as a student, graduating student to McGill and was rejected, Elton yeah, somehow got me into bishop. I told that story often until McGill told me to stop it. <laughs> but Elton Scott, in his own right, he was a Rhodes Scholar. He was a professor of the Mountain, a professor of, I guess it was the Mountain professor of pastoral theology for years, I don't know how long, at bishops. And again, a man, he was our chaplain down in Catalan. A man that was absolutely adored by tons and tons of people. A really first rate, proud rate, and university chaplain. And then, and really Harry should, should be on the board for this, but Harry Scott, who was Lowell Scott's son, uh, went to McGill. They all went to Bishops, I don't even have to say that, but he graduated from. Bishop and then went to McGill. And he saw that there was nothing going on in cardiovascular surgery. There was some surgery in the heart, but cardiovascular surgery had not really been developed at McGill. So Harry took it upon himself to go down to Boston. And he had himself in a university hospital where he could watch them doing arterial surgery, cardiovascular surgery. And then he came back, and there's a lot of things that were said that, oh, Harry wasn't an academic. He may not have been an academic. I think he produced about 30 books, but apart from that, he taught the people at McGill cardiovascular surgery and went on to be undoubtedly, along with people that are still there, Dr. Mulder, for example. And the whole department that was developed was due, I think, most people would admit to Harry's initial initiative. So he had that same driving, uh, get it done uh, uh, personality that many of them had. Just to go back to the Chief Justice, I was remembering during the night seeing Johnny Pepper, who was a tough young student and not easily covered. And he was standing outside the Chief Justice's office shaking. I said, Johnny, what are you doing? He said, well, I left my civil code on the Chief Justice's desk. And I'm trying to figure out whether to go back in or just get another civil code. <laughs> that, was the, that was the impact that uh, the Chief Justice had on us. He was the chairman of the board of bishops at one point, and John Molson was the president. And one thing William Scott wanted, he wanted a hockey rink, and he wanted it named the W.B. Scott Rink. I don't know if Molson wanted it or didn't want it, but his excuse was, you raise the money first, well. Well, says, no, 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 he'll get the You raise the money first. We will not build the rink until you do. Molson then got on a boat to go to England on business, and Judge Scott called for Denver. By the time he came back, the W.B. Scott ring was to all intents and purposes built because they had great money by then. All personality traits of the Scots, in a way. And then, 
It was Mary. And Mary was the only girl in the family. And she was, I'm told by everybody, an ordered by her cousins. And the Scott story goes on because then the Kellys, all the burials, and see, and as you know, one was elected, was it Jeff? I can't remember which was Jeff, but was elected for the MNA for Jacques Archer, and his son just recently has been elected to replace him. So again, there's, there's Scott blood all over the place, uh, whether the name is Scott or by marriage somebody else. We owe a lot in this country, in this province, and in this country to the Scott family, to Archdeacon, to Archdeacon's wife, Amy, I think. Uh, and I congratulate and say hands off to Peter for thinking up and taking the initiative to put this afternoon together. So those of you who knew or didn't know a Scot or the Scots can come to celebrate our great joy at having been this much of the life of one or all. I'm Freeman Ng, and I'm a former student of Peter Dale Scott's, and I'll be giving a brief biographical introduction before turning things over to Peter. Peter was born in Montreal and earned undergraduate degrees in philosophy and political science from McGill University. After studying at Oxford, he returned to get his PhD in political science from McGill in 1955. He briefly taught there before serving as a Canadian diplomat in the UN Assembly and the Canadian Embassy in Warsaw. In 1961, he joined the faculty of the University of California at Berkeley where he became a major voice in the anti-war movement, co-founding the Peace and Conflict Studies Program and the Coalition on Political Assassinations, and in 1965, being the first faculty member to speak out against the war in an on-campus public event, and being the featured speaker at the first ever teach-in. Peter is most well known for his political writing, especially for his development and application of the terms deep politics and the deep state to American politics. His political books include Deep Politics and the Death of JFK, The Road to 9-11, American War Machine, and The American Deep State. But he has also published several volumes of poetry, which include Mosaic Orpheus, Tilting Point, and Walking on Darkness. In 1988, the book that many consider to be his most important to date, Coming to Jakarta, which combined poetry and autobiography with a political expose of the 1965 Indonesian massacre, was published in Canada. In 1989, it was published in America by New Directions Press, whose founder, James Laughlin, said, not since, quote, not since Robert Duncan's groundwork, and before that, William Carlos Williams's Patterson has New Directions published a long poem as important as Peter Dale Scott's. Robert Haas, the poet and critic who would later serve as an American poet laureate, called Coming to Jakarta, quote, the most important political poem to appear in the English language in a very long time. Coming to Jakarta is only the first part of a trilogy of long poems that Peter has entitled Seculum, the second part, Listening to the Candle, was published in 1992, and the trilogy was completed with the publication of Minding the Darkness in the year 2000. The poet Scott Peck called the completed trilogy, quote, one of the essential long poems of the past half century. Peter's latest book is Poetry and Terror, Politics and Poetics in Coming to Jakarta, where he discusses the history content and significance of coming to Jakarta and his evolving understanding of it, and goes on to write about the potential of poetry for both personal and political healing. And now, without further ado, Peter Dale Scott. Hello to everybody in Montreal. Um, 
I'm very, very pleased to be part of this important event, and I'm very grateful to Peter Margo, first of all, for visualizing it, and then for making it happen. And I'm grateful also to my old friend uh, Freeman Ng, who I've done many, many videos with, because we did a whole series of videos about coming to Jakarta, which are now more than half of this book, Poetry and Terror. And uh, in working with uh, the videos with Freeman, I, I learned more about myself and my poem when I did the videos, and I learned even more about myself when uh, we did the book. And Peter Margo, I've learned more about myself pre trying to prepare this uh, video presentation for you. So thank you for that also. You're not the first to have this idea. It was ten years ago, a quite famous Canadian historian, an award-winning Canadian historian, approached me and said he wanted to write about me in connection with my father and grandfather. And, um, you know, ten years, or a few years before that, I had been approached by another award-winning author who, wanted, who wrote for The New Yorker, and he wanted to write a profile about me for The New Yorker. And I said no to him because I felt I was too young still to be memorialized in that way. But the idea of being connected to my grandfather and father, I really liked, and I said that to the historian. But then he gave me his projected title for the book, and I, I can't get all of it. There's only word, one word in it that I am sure was in. Roughly it went something like F.G. Scott, F.R. Scott, P.D. Scott, colon, vision, achievement, and, and this is the word I am very sure of, betrayal. <laughs> I said, I don't think, I've, I don't see myself as a traitor to my father and grandfather. And he said, oh, I don't mean it in that sense at all. I couldn't think of any good sense that it could be, but, you know, I was willing to go ahead and see what happened. Well, a few months after that, there was a conference held, a week-long conference held in my honor in New York at the Open Center, and so I invited him to come and be a speaker about me as a traitor or whatever he wanted to do. And uh, he declined the invitation to speak, but he did come to the conference. I remember him sitting in the front row, taking quite a few notes. Anyway, something f failed to click, and he never produced that book. So this, as far as, I've heard, as far as I know, this event tonight is the first time that anything like this has happened. I want to mention uh, one of my most vivid memories from childhood because it, I think it had quite an impact on me. It may have been the last time my grandfather came to visit us in Westmount and he was here for lunch and he said at his end of the table mischievously, he said, I would like to say grace before the meal, but I know that Frank and Marion don't want Peter to find out that there is a God. Uh, whether he deliberately planted those words deep into my brain, I don't know, but they went deep into my brain. And I think, you know, my, father's, my father was a humanist. And uh, those of you who know his poetry know that he has a very short epigrammatic poem where he says, the spirit of man is my God, and the future of man is my heaven. And in my middle years, I would have thought that was too flip and glib a way to deal with matters as serious as God and heaven. But in my old age, I've come to the point where I feel I am both my grandfather's grandson and also my father's son, and that my own vision of what religion and culture is is large enough to see both of those uh, both of those approaches as true. I suppose in my practice I'm more like my grandfather really because 
I go quite often to services and I've even given a, uh, a sermon or two. But uh, the, the, uh, the difference is that I'm now married to my dear wife, uh, Rhonda Kabasnik, who has inspired me. She said, my most creative period is being married to her and producing. It's almost a book a year in my 80s and now, not hopefully, in my 90s. And um, I don't go to a church anymore. And I'm not even going to a Buddhist temple anymore. I'm going to a Jewish synagogue. And it's, uh, that is my current practice. My father, um, a kind of optimism. I, I think it has to do with being Canadian. That uh, there was, I haven't talked about, yes, others talked about my father's political development, but he was, um, he came back with a kind of aesthetic orientation from Oxford and then as a deep professor of law, he saw the depression and the demonstrations of the unemployed who wanted food and the brutal reaction of the police, and he intervened. And he became political, but in an optimistic way. He wasn't trying to overthrow the Canadian system of government. He was trying to correct a, a way in which it was deficient. And so he and a group of friends some of them clergymen, quite a few of them clergymen, started a new party, the, the CCF, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, which is now the NDP. And uh, they thought they could do it because Canada was a relatively small country and you could make a difference. And Canada, the, the CCF became the uh, official government in uh, Saskatchewan, and I think the NDP has been in British Columbia and in Ontario. It has been a successful political party. So that created in me the illusion, if you like, or the belief that individuals can make a difference. And um, carrying it into American politics, that, that belief takes a bit of a beating. Uh, it's not as easy as it was back in McGill in 1947, but um, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, I sustain that belief. I, my, my mother, my mother is the real yin in me. She was a painter, not verbal, like my father, and it's hard to verbalize what I got from her, but what I got from her was very powerful. And what I got from the marriage of my father, my yang, my yang father, to my yin mother, certainly inspired my trilogy, which grew out of coming to Jakarta, because the first volume is uh, about Indonesia and is yang and dedicated to my father. Then my mother said, but you know, you, you were also a happy child. And uh, she... <laughs> I realized that the, the poem, which I thought was to be about everything, was really only about one side of life. And so I wrote uh, Listening to the Candle and dedicated it to my mother. And it, a lot of it is about my mother and things that my mother showed me and about art. And then I was had two poems going in opposite directions, a uh, pessimistic uh, coming to Jakarta and a, optimistic. That's oversimplifying, but anyway, they were two opposite poems. And um, this may be, I, I realized it, that they were all written in tercets. They looked like Dante's comedy, and that a third volume was needed, and that is Mining the Darkness. I had good schooling in Montreal. I went to St. George's School. And in the seventh grade, um, I, my father had a Guggenheim. We all went down to Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I had a year at Shady Hill School in Cambridge in 1940. At that point, Canada was at war and, and uh, with Germany, and America was not yet. So that was something that we all thought about quite a lot. And uh, anyway, I'm very grateful for that year. Uh, I came back, finished in Westmount High School, and then went to McGill, 
and I had a great deal of great deal of trouble picking majors. I started in honors math and physics, but the real reason I liked the physics it was uh, David Keyes, my professor, who left to go and head up the new Atomic Energy Commission in Canada. I did not like his successor, and besides, I found I was a bit lazy to be a real scientist. It was so much easier to do humanities courses. After a great deal of uh, heart-wrenching anxiety uh, and a, almost a nervous breakdown, I finally elected to major in philosophy and political science. And I do want to mention one course that was uh, particularly important to me. It was a seminar on the thought of Alfred North Whitehead taught by one of Whitehead's own students, a Montrealer by the name of, well, I was going to say Tommy Henderson, because my mother told me that he'd been an old boyfriend of hers before she got married. That seminar is important to me because I, I, I still think about Whitehead and see it, Whitehead's philosophy, his process philosophy is a way of reconciling concerns about theology with concerns about quantum physics, actually using quantum physics as a corrective to the more static physics of the Enlightenment, which has been one of the major themes of my recent work. I had a very, uh, you might even say, successful time at Oxford until I ultimately failed my degree. I was... Um, I won a poet, second prize in a poetry contest, and I became first the poetry editor of the main college magazine, the ISIS, and then was appointed editor-in-chief. But meanwhile, I had got into an argument about Hegel with my f politics dons, some of whom, were, like Isaiah Berlin, were quite famous. I talk about this in this book and in coming to Jakarta. Um, let's just say that uh, I was a bit ahead of my time because uh, it was only a year or two later that another Canadian, Charles Taylor, came from Montreal and changed the point of view of the Dons at Oxford in the way that I failed. Um, anyway, I, I had this uh, rich life drank a great deal of sherry, um, and uh, made some very good friends. Uh, but in the end, uh, I was the only person to take the Hegel exam, which they printed up just for me, and I failed it. And I will just say that when I went in to see Isaiah Berlin, he said, your, your question, your answer sounded just like Michael Foster who had been one of my other dons at Oxford. And I, Michael Foster was a very pious man, and he was also the last of the Hegel metaphysicians who had really characterized Oxford in the 19th century in the era of Bozanquit and Bradley. Uh, and so I said to Isaiah Berlin, what you've just said I take as an honor. And it was a difference of opinion between Foster and uh, and Zaya Berlin, but it was Berlin who set the exam and not Foster, so so I failed. Because I had a, a, a major psychological Oedipal problem with my father being a famous poet, a famous professor, and a famous politician. So what the only idea that was clear in my mind at that time was I wasn't sure about not being a poet, but I didn't want to be a professor and I didn't want to be a politician. And I, as I often said to my students later on, I failed on all three counts because I sort of did end up being a kind of, not exactly carbon copy, but uh, in my father's footsteps, an acorn under the oak. Uh, of my father. I took the Foreign Service exam for the Canadian Department of External Affairs and I passed the exam. I started as a diplomat 
I really had a time of my life as a diplomat. I loved the United Nations where I went to two sessions and I loved going to dinner parties where no two people were of the same, uh, the same country. And you didn't even know what language you'd be speaking because by then I had English and French and a little German, uh, a bit of Italian. But the important thing is that I went to Poland. Uh, it's not a country I chose. I didn't know any Polish when I said they gave me some tapes or they were records, discs in those days. I had six months of listening to discs. But when I got to Poland, um, uh, they gave me money to hire a tutor. And the tutor, by great luck, was a former girlfriend of the Polish poet Zbigniew Herbert, who at that time had not been translated into English, and I may, I don't know, but I may have been the first person ever to translate him into English, which was one of the main ways that I learned Polish. And I got into a whole set of poets and artists and intellectuals in Warsaw. Um, you know, Czesław Miłosz, whom I eventually knew because of all this, wrote The Captive Mind, saying how it was so hard for people to think behind the Iron Curtain. I had, was the good luck to be there during what they called the Polish Thaw. There had been a, a, an uprising in 1956, well, three actually, Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia a little bit, and above all, Hungary, which was a, a major, uh, a major conflict in which many people died and thousands of people emigrated. Uh, but Poland, as a result of all that, did experience a thaw, and I. I, I was so stimulated. That may have been the most stimulating environment I've ever been in my life. It was behind the Iron Curtain. One of my professors at McGill, the only one who ever, ever gave me a C grade, maybe he felt a bit guilty about it or something. Anyway, he enticed me to come back to Berkeley and to excuse me to McGill, and get a PhD in political science. By now I was quite convinced I didn't like political science and was sorry I'd read in a way that I had taken that scholarship. But um, he said they would count my experience at Oxford towards the residency requirements. And so I said, well, and it, just to cover this shame of having failed, which I took very seriously then, I'm quite happy that I failed now. It, it pointed me in a better direction for my life. I um, I accepted. I came back. I did the oral exam and after six weeks and passed it. And I, then I wanted to write about Hegel. And they said, no, 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 don't write about Hegel. You'll never get a job if you do Hegel. And I said, well, who should I write about then? They said, well, anybody, just not Hegel. I said, how about T.S. Eliot? They said, oh, much better than Hegel. And that was a really crucial moment for my life because it meant I got, I didn't have a PhD in English, but I had a political science PhD on Eliot. And that eventually landed, help, or was a big factor in getting my job at the University of California, where I taught in all for 34 years. just about the time that I arrived at, uh, at Cal in 1961, Indochina began to heat up and uh, there was a crisis in Laos, there were a series of crises in Laos. I, I knew almost nothing about Indochina, but uh, it was the case that Canada and Poland were both on the control commission to to oversee the 1954 Geneva Accords. So that meant that vast amounts of cables arrived in the Canadian Embassy in case there was ever a need to discuss something with Poland, which never happened. But somebody had to read all those cables and that fell to the junior officer who was me. I didn't remember anything out of all these uh, cables. They were endless except an Australian 
uh, and I had it had some issues with Australians when at the UN. Uh, they were more pro-American than I was. And here was an Australian saying at some occasion in Indochina that he would never trust America again. I did know enough from all those cables to be sure that it would not be good for America to get involved in Indochina the way France got involved in Vietnam, which was the death of the Fourth Republic. Um, and I started very early, first of all, just petitions. I first, I think it was my first summer there, I signed a petition. My second summer there, I rewrote a petition to make it, I thought, a little more credible. It was drafted by a mathematician who perhaps didn't know very much about politics. And anyway, by early 1965, um, I had, oh, and I, and I taught a class in the speech department where you had to look at politics from different points of views. And I took Vietnam to get the difference between the, the Soviet point of view, the French point of view, the American point of view. So I had been boning up on Vietnam after I came to Cal. And in 1965, the year of the first major troop movements, I, um, I became the designated person to speak about Vietnam. And I always said, you should get an American to speak about this. And they said, there are no Americans here who know anything about it. So as a Canadian, uh, I spoke up saying that we, meaning America, should not get involved in Vietnam. And that produced the first book I was ever part of, one of three authors, but perhaps the main author, uh, The Politics of Escalation in Vietnam. And I remember being very disappointed when I went to visit. The next time I was in Washington, I dropped into the embassy where I had friends. But I found that my friends had, were quite offended by the book. And I said, what, do you, what don't you like about the book? Have you read it? And they said, well, I don't like the title, for example, Politics of Escalation. But there was a politics of escalation that America fended off others like Utant or de Gaulle, who started peace initiatives. If there was a peace initiative, the response was more bombing of Indochina by the Americans, and that was the theme of the book. And that got me involved into a lot of speaking about Vietnam, and a lot of speaking about what I considered a related topic, which was the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Uh, a lot of people doubted the official version in those days, but very few people spoke about it. And certainly, I may have been the first academic to have spoken about it. Now, why was that a related topic? Because one of the things that I established in my Vietnam research, and I think is not disputed now, because we have the documents now, thanks to the Pentagon Papers, um, that the, Kennedy had a plan to start withdrawing troops from Vietnam, get the bulk of them out by the 65, but <coughs> to get some of them out in 63, this plan was announced on November 20th, 1963, and it was secretly annulled, uh, though it was not obvious at the time, on November 26th, 1963. The difference being that uh, the man annulling it on November 26th was Lyndon Baines Johnson, because Kennedy being assassinated on November the 22nd. Now, did those two events have anything to do with each other, the assassination and the uh, cancellation of the thing? I can't give definitive answers about any of this because this is all in the area of what I came to call deep politics. Uh, you, you have to speculate about things which are beyond the documentation. But that uh, sort of created the doubleness in me for the next uh, decade or more that I was uh, teaching me the medieval literature in the English department, writing poetry, and at the same time I was doing quite a lot of speaking 
about the Vietnam War and the Kennedy assassination. Something else had happened in my life in the 1980s, and we have to go back to uh, actually 1975. Because I had been doing all the speaking, I was invited to speak in Germany, and the CIA intercepted the invitation, and uh, I got a phone call from a friend in Berkeley who had had a phone call from somebody else saying, when is I going to answer the, my, the invitation? I said, what invitation? I don't know what you're talking about. And they said, it was mailed to you t two months ago. Well, it arrived the next day in the mail with a postage stamp from uh, just outside Palm Springs, where there's a big Navy secret base. So obviously that letter had been intercepted, and once I knew that it existed, they were kind enough to forward it. I never got to the conference because, well, that's, a, <laughs> that's another story. But anyway, I couldn't go to the conference. It, things got worse. But what happened all that, I was now in the kind of international um, level of anti-war activity. I was invited to be on the, uh, the, the Bertrand Russell Tribunal, the International War Crimes Tribunal in Oslo. I've seen my FBI file. My FBI file says I was there. I, I didn't get there. But now I knew all these people. And one of them, a man called Malcolm Caldwell, in England, he was a Scot, a member of the Labour Party, he was a member of Parliament, I think, at that time, I'm not sure. Anyway, he said, you've got to write about the massacre in Indonesia, and, he's, and I said, but I don't know anything about it. And he said, well, neither does anybody else. That's the whole point. And so I wrote an article for a book that he got published in England, in Nottingham, uh, about the, C the role of the CIA in the overthrow of Sukarno. And I became really quite obsessed with the fact that here had been a massacre of, we thought then, maybe between half a million and a million. Recently, the BBC has estimated it may have been as many as three million. But it was a huge massacre, and the United States was involved. It was clearly involved in helping the uh, the people doing the killing, and I went out on a limb and said that the CIA was also involved in the false flag coup, as it was called, coup attempt by the communists, which was the excuse for the massacre. Uh, I think history is well born. No, we have the again we have the records of uh, CIA government support at high levels for the groups that were carrying out the killing. That's not an issue anymore. It's still a question whether they were involved in the false flag coup attempt called Gestapo, and I remain confident they were. But I became very depressed that I knew this fact, and I knew then quite a lot also about the CIA and drugs. I knew these things, and I was talking about them, and nobody was listening. I did a great deal. I did a great many radio broadcasts, and each time I did it, I felt more and more frustrated. And it came to almost a, one night in 1980. Reagan had just been elected. That was a factor. Um, I had a terrible night. I drunk too much. That was a big factor. And I had a night in what? Watertown, Massachusetts, where I thought I was losing my mind, and by the end of the night, I felt I'd already lost it. I'd been crazy, not just for 24 hours, but for the last decade, when I had been telling people things that they were not capable of hearing. And as a result of that, shall we call it, panic attack or a mini breakdown, I just not was not the first one I'd had in life, um, but I don't. It was a, a very scary one while it happened, and the result of that breakdown was that I started to try to heal myself by just writing poetry, and as I wrote and wrote and wrote furiously for six weeks, 
the end of six weeks I had a book length poem called Coming to Jakarta which I then polished for the next seven or eight years. I, re I retired in 1995, it really pretty much uh, f booted out the door with a golden parachute, which uh, I didn't want to do at the time, but it's been the best part of my life has been since my retirement. Because of my 20 odd books that I've written, more than half have been written in the uh, not quite 25 years since I retired, both on the poetry side and particularly on the prose side. Um, and uh, most recently, they have been healing this yang yin doubleness in me because I'm writing about both poetry and politics for the first time. This is the first book in prose to deal both with politics and poetry, why uh, the best poetry needs to be addressing politics and why the best politics needs to be aware of poetry. Uh, and this is the theme of my life since then.